Hi, uh, welcome to uh, ShedX um, Lockdown Legacies. Um, I'm going to be speaking to Ben Span in a moment from uh, Change Your Life, Put Down Your Knife. Uh, Ben's going to be sharing his uh, story um, and talking a little bit about his life and why he uh, set up um, the uh, charity. Um, so I'm just going to get this shared on a couple of pages. Um, and then I'm going to uh, try and invite Ben onto here and then let's see if we can uh, get something done. Uh, so if you just have to excuse me for a moment while I... Hello there to the two people that have uh, just come in. Um, if you could, if people could share this link, remember you can share this um, uh, live uh, in your um, uh, timelines, um, and we can uh, see what we can do. Let me just get that shared that to my. Um, if you could let me know when you're in, Ben, and uh, I'll get you invited. Do, do, do. I have to excuse me while I do, doing all this on my own, so... Get this shared on a couple of timelines, um, and I've been asked to tag a couple of people. Can everybody hear me? All right. There we go, and then get that shared. Brilliant. Hi Ben. Right, I'm gonna um, bring you onto camera. Hello, oh, mate. How's it going, buddy? You all right? Right, I can't hear you at the minute. Hang on. Can everybody hear me? I can, I can hear you. Oh, sorry. Just a couple of technical issues. <coughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. I can't hear you, mate. Um, I'll try it like this. Right, I um, I can't hear you, Ben. Um, is your sound on, mate? Uh, ah, got you. Brilliant. Um, I had you hooked up to a um, a mic, and unfortunately, it was cutting off my sound, um, so I couldn't hear you. Um, so yeah, um, if we just want to wait a couple of minutes, wait till um. Couple of people join us and then we can start, yeah? Is that all right? Yeah, no problem, mate. Brilliant. Need a nice hot roof for tonight, it's a bit cold out here. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you from, mate? Uh so I'm originally from uh Wakefield. Yeah. Um, but I've lived in Norfolk for twenty years. Um so I live in a uh, a, a small market town about nine miles outside Norwich. Um, absolutely beautiful place, and it saved my life. I remember turning my life around, and yeah, absolutely adore it. Yeah, <laughs> I was I was very fortunate. I was homeless, and um, I'm uh, one of the women that served me at the the food bank. Uh, they had these coffee mornings. Um, took me out for a sandwich, and she never got rid of me. And we got married. Um, a year ago, coming up to a year ago, on the twenty eighth yeah. of this month. So, 
Brilliant. Yeah, we're doing all right. How, when was um, when was how long ago was you homeless, buddy? Uh, so I was homeless for near enough two years. Yeah. Um, I was uh, homeless, addicted. I had um, some major mental health issues. And um, after my first marriage ended, um, and I had a pretty hard time for a few years. And then yeah, yeah. Um, I met my beautiful to be wife. Um, so I've been clean now um, for six years, four months. Um, and we got together not long after I got first, you know, clean. And uh, yeah. My life is just going up now, so we're getting there. Fair play, buddy. In fact, she's watching now. Hello, darling. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. Can I ask you, uh, what were you addicted to, mate? Do you mind me asking? Or? Um, all sorts, mate. Oh, you know, um, I've done pretty much every drug that is out there at some point yeah. in my life. Coke, crack, anything I could get out of, really. Yeah. Um, I wasn't a nice person. Um, I was quite violent. And uh, yeah, I um, not only did I find my wife, but I, I, I found a faith and I found a, you, you know, a, a, a whole community, a whole church. Yeah. Um, kind of stepped up to uh, look after me and my family. Um, when I got uh, in hospital with uh, tuberculosis through the uh, sort of life that I led. Yeah, yeah. Ended up with tuberculosis, uh, pulmonary pneumonia, um, a couple of other things on my chest. And um, yeah, I uh, had a mental breakdown in hospital. I thought um, the world was ending and all my loved ones were being replaced by robots. So, been there, done that, wrote the book about it, literally. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? So, just finished my third book, about to start the fourth. Third and place, now yeah. these ShedX things as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I think we'll start. Um, people can join in when they want, and uh, even if we don't get numbers, you know, I know for a fact numbers will come in. Afterwards, the Dr. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not about numbers, mate. To me, it's about spreading a message and uh, spreading the awareness of the campaign. At the end of the day, so even exactly if you get to twenty people at the end of the day, it's uh, it's it's still it's still spreading the awareness of what we're trying to do. At the end of the day, mate. So, 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 um, can you tell me a bit about your life? Yeah, I never had a bad life, mate. I grew up with um, four brothers uh, and a sister. Um, my lifestyle growing up wasn't bad at all. Um, I wouldn't say where I came from. My parents split up when I was probably about 12, I think. Um, met new partners. They both had kids with uh, a child of, with each other. Uh, well, well, child of their own. My mum and dad, my mum and stepdad had a, a son. And uh, my mum and, uh, no, sorry, my dad and my stepmom, they had a daughter. So she's my only, she's the only sister out of, um, five boys um so yeah um uh, when i was um got to 16 mate i started smoking cannabis um and that was my lifestyle basically right up until i was probably about late 20s early 30, probably 30 say at the latest um and then between 30 and 35 i was i was smoking it and then not smoking it but in between all of that, I was um, started off just smoking it, then selling it to my friends, then selling it to uh, other people locally, then started cultivating it. Um, so sort of, I don't know what to what to say about it really. That was that, like I said, that was my lifestyle really. I I, I enjoyed smoking it, but recently realised that um, it wasn't for me. Sort of thing made me lazy. Uh, it just dictated my life, mate, for the for the last. 16 years when I was when I was smoking it from 16 up until like 30 years old so um, a couple of months ago well I say a couple of months ago probably March um, 
I was smoking this, uh, it was meant to be THC vape juice, um, which turned out to actually be a pharmaceutical drug, um, which was, uh, when I tested it uh, with a urine test, it came back as pre gabbling um, So, yeah, um, and it really fucked my head up, mate, to be honest with you. Are we allowed to swear? Of course you are, mate. Yes, <laughs> just checking. <laughs> Uh, it messed my head up, mate, really bad. It um, sent me into a massive state of depression, um, which I never thought I'd suffer with. I mean, growing up, if you'd said to me that I'd have depression, I'd sort of laugh it off and th thought it was for no disrespect to people that suffer with depression and mental health, but I thought it was for the weak-minded. That was my uh, opinion of it. Um, until it kicked me in the balls, mate, basically, and uh, got hold of me, basically. And I, I, I realised that... Um, how serious it was and how much it doesn't mess with your mind and how and the negative thoughts that are constantly going through your mind. Um, I thought that I weren't good enough for my family. I've been with my missus uh, since I was just turning 18. So um, from 18 till now, I'm 35. We got married in January. Um, yeah, and the, but just before the COVID kicked in, luckily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that was... Um, it was quite hard for me to be honest with you to uh, to deal with it. I was thinking about killing myself on uh, on a daily basis, or not so much. I never thought that I'd follow it through, but I had the thoughts of had different ways of how how I would do it. You know, um, I even thought about suffocating my missus, um, which made me too scared to fall asleep just in case I actually I actually woke up in the morning and I had done it. So it was like. Um, yeah, it wasn't a good place to be, to be honest with you. You could say it was self-inflicted because I was smoking this this juice, um, but it sort of it was sort of a build up of everything. I think I was struggling at work. Um, a, a, a guy that I was working for decided that he was going to take me to court, um, so that was the 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 point where I, I shut the business down. This was two days after I got married as well. So uh, two days after we got married, I had the termination from the contracts that were set up in place with, for me and the uh, job that we were doing. I used to do garage conversions. Right. Um, so I let a lot of people down in that respect as well because they, they, people relied on me for, for work, basically, and to feed, their, to feed their families and whatever else. They just just live just day-to-day -day living. And I just shut it down, knocked it on the head completely. But... Um, at that point then, I was locking myself in the house for days upon end. Um, I wasn't really communicating with anyone. I would just lay on the sofa, festering away, making food was too much hassle. Um, knocking, as soon as someone knocked at the door, it put me into like an anxiety attack. I turned my mobile phone off, so I was uncontactable. And my phone stayed off for months, probably four months. Um, and eventually I went to my, a friend of mine's house. The only time I really used to go out was to get juice. So I used to pop round to a friend of mine, his name, uh, well, there, there was a couple, Sharon and Chunk. And I was sat round there one day and I just burst out into tears, mate. I was uh, a blubbering mess. And that, was, that wasn't me, you know, that was, that was sort of um, a bit of a wake up call because it was, I just couldn't control it. I couldn't control what was coming out and, uh, and the, the floods of tears that I was in. And they sort of cons consult uh, well they sort of uh, reassured me that everything was going to be okay and, and said look go go and speak to your missus this is quite serious so that's what i done i came home spoke to my missus about it and um done exactly the same thing burst out into tears and it was just just uncontrollable really so it was not a good place to be um like i said it, it was probably self-inflicted to be honest but it's still it was still something that i had to deal with at the time so I ended up going over to Ireland to see my brother, my uh, younger brother, Chris, to take myself out of the scenario in the and just day to day shit that was that I was going through. And it, it I wouldn't say it solved the problem, but it was certainly um, certainly helped me massively. I took my little lad with me. He's, he was fifteen yesterday. I took him with me. Uh, and that moment in time, I'd done a post about this a couple of weeks ago. And um, at that moment in time, he, I felt like I was the child. Um, if it wasn't for him being with me, I wouldn't have even got to Ireland. He, um, he, I was a bit of a mess, having panic attacks and all these mad thoughts. Um, even on the plane, I was having real bad panic attacks and sort of hyperventilating and stuff. So if it wasn't for him being with me, he took me through passport control and 
and um, sat with me and just reassured me that everything was going to be all right. That was a massive turning point for me then in my life. I uh, I, I sort of realised that I, I was quite money orientated. I've always been quite money orientated growing up, and I, that was sort of my uh, first thought all the time. You know, was money and trying to trying to have these materialistic things, and we liked our holidays and stuff. But after that moment. Um, I've just realised that things like that don't mean a lot, really. Your health's more important than anything. So, And it was the start of, of the campaign, basically. Um, there's another little story as well. There's a, a young lad that we used to, um, my girlfriend or my wife now, she's got two um, of the kids, Georgia and Callum. They're 22 and 23, or maybe 23 and 24. Um, and as Callum was growing up, he used to play football on a Saturday and Sunday. Quite, He was quite a good little player. And one of the lads that used to come to football was a lad called Kira. And uh, he was the lad that would turn up with um, a dirty kit and boots that were too small for him. Um, sometimes he wouldn't turn up because he just couldn't afford to, the subs, etc. And Kieran came back into our life when he was a little bit older. I gave him some work. Um, we worked in the exhibitions together. Um, he, he worked as a labourer when I was doing the building. Uh, and he went through a bit of a tough patch where he was living in a crack den. Uh, he'd been stabbed multiple times. Um, and he was due to go to jail when I actually bumped into him again. Um, and he was looking at, he, he punched a military police officer, broke his jaw, off duty one, uh, in the kebab house. So when I, when I bumped into him again, he explained the situation to me. Um, I gave him some work again, just building up to this. But we also done him like some character references, me and my wife. Um, we also done him a, um, a one from the business as well. And I went to court with him and spoke to his barrister. And I'd already spoke to a barrister that I've used previously, uh, explained the situation to him. And he sort of told me how, how we should lay it out. Um, so that's what we've done. We, I've spoke to the barrister and he, luckily he got off with it. He was due to be sentenced at Crown Court. That's what he was going for, his sentencing. But they said, look, if he can stick to these certain guidelines, um, stay employed with myself um, and stick to these certain guidelines that they let, they set out for him, then they'd, they'd keep him out of jail, basically. And that's what he'd done. He, stu he stuck to them for the three months, went back to court and it ended, it ended up getting... Um, it was just got... I don't know what you would call it. It's not no further action, is it? But it got chucked out of court, basically. Yeah. Um, it, we got him out of the crack den, got him living in a hostel. Uh, and that was like a good sense of, that gave me a good sense of, um, a good feeling, you know, being able to help someone like that. So that was another contribution to the, to the campaign as well. Mm -hmm. So the campaign came around through multiple, build up of multiple, multiple things that have happened previously uh, in my life, really. Um, Having my lad being fourteen and an impressionable age, who thinks that um, that this this sort of gangster life is the way forward, mm. that was a that was the a, a catalyst point as well. So, all these multiple reasons helped me help me develop something that's that's taken off really well. You know, over the last three, I think we're coming up to the fourth month. Um, we've achieved a hell of a lot. Um, you have, yeah. We, yeah, we've got a brilliant team behind us as well. We wouldn't be in this position if it wasn't for the team that we've got behind us. I say this all the time because it's true at the end of the day. Um, if it wasn't for the, the, the likes of Terry Ellis and Vinnie Bradish, Darren Baden, Tony Turner, um, Brian and Emma Cockrell, uh, Hannah, Hannah Brennan, all, all of these guys are, are what's driven this to, to the point where it is now. So I came up with the idea um, at the beginning. I got surrounded myself with a good team of people. Uh, and between all of us, we've, we've driven it to the point of where it is now. So, uh, and, and we've done this all during COVID as well. So, mm. um, I mean, we, we've been used to these restrictions in terms of the campaign. Yeah. Um, but what I'd like to know is where would we actually be if we wasn't restricted? You know, we, we would be, uh, we'd, we'd be a hell of a lot further forwards than what we are. So, mm. so can you, t can you tell us a bit more about the campaign? Uh, what sort of stuff you do? Um, how these people like um, uh, like Bry Cockrell, um, I know Steve Rafe is involved as well. Yeah, um, so Steve's like an ambassador. He he works with Brian quite closely. He's Brian's um, he's Brian's manager. We um, not manager. Um, I can't think of what you call it. He's he works with Brian anyway, basically. 
<clears throat> yeah, so basically the campaign, we broke it down into three sections, uh, three relevant sections that we think would help make a difference. So we've got prevention, rehabilitation and education. Mm -hmm. um, so our prevention programmes, we do things like sponsor football teams, boxing clubs, and anything really that the youth could get involved with that will help take them out of um, either the gang life or the thoughts of entering that sort of lifestyle. So if we can fill their time and occupy their time with positive things, sport, could be music, um, anything along them lines, then that's what we do. So, so far we, we're sponsoring football teams, uh, multiple football teams, boxing clubs, providing them with um, sports equipment, i.e. kits, um, tracksuit bottoms and tops, boxing gloves. I've actually got a boxing glove here, actually. This, this, <laughs> this is one that... Um, so this is one of the gloves that we've provided for nice. the, uh, the boxing teams. So anything we provide um, just has our logo on it, basically, just to help spread the message. The idea is if you've got a 12-year-old kid who stood punching a punch bag, which says change your life, put down your knife, that resonates in their minds, you know. So hopefully if he was to ever turn 14, 15 and he would have the thought of picking up a knife, um, hopefully that would that's a bit of a deterrent, you know. Uh, we know we're not going to change change anything overnight, and it's 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 hard. It's a hard subject to tackle because it's it's just something that I, I can't really explain why they do it. But it, it is a, we we haven't even scratched the surface, and there's multiple no. campaigns. In there there's a lot of campaigns out there. That they're all doing great stuff, um, and we we are trying to work together under something called One Voice. When I set the campaign up, I I sort of saw it. Um, saw a vision of everyone working together uh, so we set up a campaign uh, a group called one voice um, which basically instead of giving these groups a voice of a thousand people seven thousand people ten thousand people collectively together that gives us a voice of i think if we were to add everyone up that's on these groups we'll, we'll probably be nearly at a hundred thousand people you know so it's um it's something that we're that that we're trying to achieve as well where we work together as as um well, under the banner of one voice. So, mm. yes, our uh, rehabilitation program. We're looking at opening up a um, construction training centre. It won't. It's, we're still in the early stages. It won't won't be uh, won't be running until around the, hopefully the end of next year. It should be up and, and running. But that involves working with young offenders, uh, putting them through these construction programs. The idea will be there'll be ten week construction courses. Um, just involving things like tiling, painting and decorating, plastering, window fitting, and he, he, we've even put on their um, window cleaning because it's something that's mm. that's quite simple for them to grasp. But we'll also give them the ability to um, learn about being self-employed. Some of these people can't be committed to nine to five jobs, you know. So they've got the ability to go out there and work three days a week through whatever reason. It could be through mental health, could be through... Um, issues that they're suffering from if they can go and do three days a week and earn some money it's better than them earning it on the street so that's that's what the intention behind that is mm. uh, and then the education programs we've got education pro educational programs set up um, but we've unfortunately we've not been able to deliver any of them at the moment um, due to covid i see i see other groups that are actually getting into schools and i questioned uh, a guy the other day and just said, how 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 are you doing this? And when we're we're getting blocked at every every corner we we go round, we're getting blocked basically. And it, like you said, and it's a fair point. He's been doing it for twenty five years. He's known by all of the schools and all of these different um, educational centres. So he's established himself, in, in so they they know what he's going to deliver to them, and they they worked mm. around it also. But unfortunately, because we've not got any schools behind us to to be able to say. It's, it's a bit of a funny one. It's like I spoke to a guy from a, um, a, a charity a couple of weeks ago based in Coventry. Uh, and his, his answer to me was why we were getting blocked. He says, no one wants, no schools want to be a guinea pig. No one wants to be the first people um, to, to sample your educational program. Mm -hmm. So you need to try and get back to your roots. So um, our first school that we would be getting into would be the school that I went to, which is the school my son goes to now. Uh, from there, you can build up references to go on to other schools then and say, look, this it, 
from the from the school saying to say look this was uh this was well worth it it was um uh, inspirational it was um uh, you know, so it gives gives some positive feedback to the other schools that we'll be able to to pass forward when we're going or trying to approach others. So, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky. Again, COVID's making it tricky um, massively, mm. but we're we're in no rush. We're not going anywhere. Um, these programs will be uh, when they're ready. Every this is what I say to people: this campaign's taken its own path. It's not nothing's had to. We've not pushed anything. It's it's taken its own direction. Um, and when things have been, when things are ready for to to slot into place, and they will do, and I'm more than confident that when the schools are ready for us to go in there, um, we'll we'll be able to slot in there nicely and do what we've uh, what we what we need to do basically. So, yeah, um, you see, I've I've been on the receiving end of a knife several times, yeah, and also being homeless. I know that a lot of homeless people carry them um, and there are very few um, educational outputs out there that um, that kind of fill the market. So you are onto a niche, but um, like you say, the problem is uh, people taking you seriously enough to take you in. I've, I've looked at getting into the same sort of thing going into schools and things like that talking about my life it is difficult yeah. um there are ways that you can go uh, you might want to speak to um a guy by the name of earl ling um my, my best friend he um he works for the gang unit um he goes around schools and uh speaks about um like county lines and things like that he might be yeah. able to push you in sort of the right direction. Um, the thing is that you've, you've got these people, you, you know, the, the carry a knife, the, the get sent down, um, you do your time. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from personal experience. Um, you go in there, you get your head down, you do your time, you come out. And they put you right back into the same circumstances you were when you got put in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, well, that, that, that boils down to the prison rehabilitation, doesn't it? I think the prison rehabilitation, I think the whole prison system, um, I've not been to prison myself, but I, I've, I know plenty of people that have, and it's a, a subject that um, arises all the time. I think the prison rehabilitation system is outdated. It was something that was mentioned on one of our podcasts uh, last week um, by Paul and Ben. They think that it needs to, needs to be upgraded. These guys between them, I think they've probably done nearly 25 years in jail between them, you know, so, um, and they're only young lads as well. I mean, I think they're early 30, no, Paul's the same age as me, 35, and uh, Ben was 31, I think he said, so, it's a lot of jail time for for such a young age, you know, mm. and that's because the, that's because the rehabilitation side of things is is, is with them basically. So it's called being stuck in the system, isn't it? It doesn't matter what system you're stuck in, whether it's the care system, whether it's the the uh, prison system. It's it's you, you're set up to fail, aren't you? Basically, I think that's the way I look at it. Yeah, there aren't. Um... You know, the, the, the say there are ways to um, work your way through rehabilitation, uh, through probation and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, they do set you up to fail because, you know, the, the reoffending rate is really high at the minute as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I couldn't quote the figures, but it's probably somewhere in, in the 60, 70 percent. Um, and that, you know, compared to other countries that offer real sort of rehabilitation in prisons, um, you know, like um, some of the Nordic countries and stuff like that, that have really low reoffending because they offer things like um, what you offer, um, yeah. you, you know, education around um, not carrying knives, um, talking to victims, uh, recompense schemes. Um, things like that. Um, so, do you like um, have any people within your organisation that 
have actually been there the, um, on both sides. Um, you know, that have been convicted of knife crime or that have been through knife crime. Uh, yeah, uh, we've. I mean, the likes of um, we've got Terry Ellis, um, who's been on the the receiving end of the knife crime. Not too sure whether he's actually um, used the knife to inflict any uh, wounds on anyone or any danger. But um, Brian, Brian's been shot and stabbed several times. Um, I mean, some of these are armed robber, ex-armed robbers. Mm -hmm. I, I'd say that most of them have been on the receiving end of a knife, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, not too sure if they've used one, but they, uh, they've they certainly been on the end of one. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing with these guys. We, we've got uh, the team that we've got around us uh, have got so much experience with between them that um, whether it's whether it's to do with the street life or whether it's to do with uh, prison, um, I mean, they, they're, they're, I don't know what to call them, basically. I'd say they're notorious criminals, aren't they? They're, they're, uh, they've been there, seen it. I mean, Terry's done 18 years in prison. I think they've done 12. Um, Tony Turner's done quite a bit of prison. Darren, Darren Baden, he, he was the victim to knife crime. He got stabbed uh, multiple times, 20-odd times, actually, I believe. Um, so he, he's been on the receiving end of it. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, we are. We, 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 this is the thing. We talk from experience, mate, at the end of the day. So it's, uh, again, I haven't been stabbed personally. I have my leg slashed with a Stanley knife um, what, at one point, but I've, I've never been stabbed or been slashed. Um, so I, I, I can't really comment on it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm the one with the least experience out of everyone in, in, in our group, you know. I'm not, I'm, I've never claimed to be a, a, a gangster or, or anything like that, you know. I've, I've just, I've just done what I've had to do in my life just to provide for, for my family, really. So, but my, I'm a, I'm squeaky clean, mate, compared to them. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's good to have um, people around you that know that sort of life, that are not just educated, um, you know. Uh, they're educated in in the ways of the streets and, and you know in the ways of life um you know yeah. it's, it's 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 all fine being book smart but if you've never really sort of seen that way of life or been involved in that way of life you don't know you know and you only know from listening to people like you and i or you know terry and um yeah. you know, people like tony um so i mean i think it's an absolutely brilliant thing that you're doing um so have you got a website um you know where can no. find you on facebook no we've not got a website at the moment we're on facebook at change your life put down your knife um we're on instagram twitter and also youtube our youtube channel um just consists of something that we set up called the 10 question podcasts yeah um there's no no um grammy's going to be awarded for the for the uh skills that are on there mate but the idea is to um, ask different people, notorious criminals, um, the same 10 questions. Um, it doesn't matter wherever you are in the country, whoever you are, whatever crimes you've committed, the answers to them questions uh, are pretty much the same. Um, the idea is for them to be used in schools um, just to show kids that, like I said, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever crimes you commit, the answers to these basic 10 questions um, they've got the same meaning although they're worded differently um the, the same the same outcome is what they're what they're saying so one of them for argument's sake was uh, how did you feel when you first went to jail simple questions that kids will understand and relate to or, or understand easily um every single one of them who speak openly and that's the ones that we have um spoke to have all said openly that they they felt worthless when that's first done that jail door shut behind them uh, they felt like they let the family down, let themselves down. Um, so another question that we ask them is, how how was you at the how did you uh, feel when you was at the peak of your crime? Um, so they'd say, yeah, we had all these materialistic things, and we had all the women and all all the all my mate or people around us associates. Um, and then we we flip that to say, how did you how was things when you was at rock bottom? And then they they flip it around, and it's it's completely different. They I think um, Brian said he was in hospital after being shot and stabbed um, and no one came to see him. 
Um, so the, all these friends that you've got at, at this point when you're at the top of your life, they sort of soon disappear when you've got nothing to offer them, you know? Um, and it's just to try and show kids that people, people, people aren't your mates at the end of the day when you're doing things like that. They're, they're just associates. They're, they're, they're Klingons. They're after one thing. It's either the, uh, the money, the free drugs or the, or the, um, the stigma of being around these sort of people. So that's the idea behind that. Um, we've got a few, we've got a, uh, I've put together a uh, march that we're doing on the 28th of November at um, Downing Street. Some people will frown upon this because of COVID. Um, but my argument to this is, look, the kids are still being killed, COVID or no COVID, you know, just because, just because we've got COVID doesn't mean we should all sit in our homes and allow it to happen. Imagine how the how the families are feeling and the, the victims that are being uh, the, the tragic victims that are losing their lives, you know. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, we may be in a pandemic, um, but I'm still going out there to represent them people that are losing their lives and to stand up and say that we need to be heard. Whether it makes any difference, I don't know. Um, chances are it won't do, um, but at least we're trying. Uh, and, we're, and we're not sitting at home reading it in the newspapers and, and, and saying, oh, poor, poor people, or, you know, we're actually out there trying to make, trying to help make a difference. So I don't know how many people are going to turn up. I'd like to think we'll get a few people. There. Hopefully I'm not going to be there on my own. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll link it on here. Um, I'll put it out on the, um, on this page as well. Um, yeah, I'll think I think Tony Turner's coming, so it'll be me and Tony Turner. So I won't definitely be on my own, but hopefully we get a few more people turn up to uh, to stand up for what what we uh, well to stand up for these our future generations. That's what it is. These kids are being killed. I mean, th these people could be future teachers, could be future professional footballers. Then they're, they're never going to live their life out now, you know, because of a coward or a mindless attack, which could be for something as stupid as living in the wrong postcode area. But looking at someone in the wrong way because you owe someone 20 quid for some drugs or 200 quid you know whether you're a drug dealer whether you're um you you owe someone money you don't deserve to lose your life you know at the end of the day it's a you may choose the wrong path but you don't deserve to lose your life over something so stupid you know no no it's um the problem is i think a lot of people when they get into that sort of life, they find themselves stuck. Um, and it's really hard to get out of, especially sort of the gang life, you know. Um, I only ever really had dealings with gangs on a, let's say, a freelance basis. Um, but I've interviewed several people from gangs uh, for, my, for the last book. Um, and they all say that it's um, it's through fear they don't leave. It's through fear that they carry weapons. It's 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 through fear that they end up doing something stupid. Yeah. Um, so you know. I, agree. I mean, I spoke to a, I spoke to a sixteen-year-old kid the other day. Um, when was it? It was yesterday, actually. I spoke to him, and I was having a good chat with him, and. Um, he said that the reason why the kids carry knives is through fear. Uh, it's through fear. I mean, his his friend got stabbed to death, um, and he said that his group of mates. Um, he's took him part of the situation now. He, he, and he's only sixteen, bearing in mind. So he's, he's been involved in um, this sort of gang life for like two two years since he was fourteen, um, and he said it's through fear that they carry one. But then his cousin works for the same. Um, so basically, I was speaking to his cousin as well, and his cousin said that he'd never carry a knife because he knows that he would never be able to use it. So if someone pulled a knife on him, he may have it on him, but he knows that he would never be able to use the knife, so it'd be pointless. Mm. It's, it's it's a shame, really, that kids kids that age feel that they have to they have to carry a knife through through fear. So, yeah, I mean, I'm quite lucky to the fact that it's not really a problem where I live um, nine miles down the road then that's a different story you know in Norwich but um, you know I'm not saying it doesn't happen in the small towns because we all know that um, crime and county lines and things like that they're, they're not exclusive to city life 
They move no. out into small towns because it's quiet and, uh, you, you know, you don't get bothered much by the police. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it does happen, but it's just not as in your face as it it, it has been sort of when I've, I've lived in Norwich. And I know people that have, you know, blatantly carried like machetes and things like that with, with no fear. Um, you know, I, I, I come from a time when a straightener was like that. You, you know, you, you, you worked it out like that and then you shook hands afterwards. But there's no such thing as that anymore. It's, you know, you're going to pull a knife out, you're going to use it, then it's, it's going to kill someone or seriously maim someone. Uh, Brian said something interesting to me that I, I always use this now, this um, analogy. He says it takes two seconds to um, to use a knife, but you're paying for it for the next 20 years. Two seconds of madness can dictate the next 20 years of your life, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's it's called the ripple effect, isn't it? I said this the other day on a podcast. It's called the ripple effect. It's if whether you, you've stabbed someone or whether you're the victim who's been stabbed. Um it's the parents of both sides are going to be are going to be destroyed, you know. Then there's brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles. It's just a massive knock-on effect. Friends, it's it's, it's, it's madness. People, uh, I don't understand how people can't value people's or have no value for people's lives. It's just nuts. It's it's kind of selfish and self-serving, uh, you know. Um, if if you got if you're going to be the sort of person that's going to carry a knife, you're going to be sort of single-minded. Uh, that's that's what I've noticed about the you know, people that carry weapons um, on a regular basis. Um, I wouldn't think twice about using them. Um, you know, and that they're they've all been sort of self-serving, and they've used the excuse, "Oh well, it's for protection," but. If you are going to walk out with a hammer under your jacket or a machete under your jacket, that's not for protection. That's going out with intent at the end of the day. If, exactly. If you carry a weapon, you're going out with the intentions of using it. But what's, what's the point in even having it? Do you know what I mean? It's not a flipping ornament, you know? If you're going out carrying a knife or, or if you're going out carrying any form of weapon, you're going out with the intent to use it. So in my opinion, whoever's caught with any form of weapon like that, whether it's a knife, a hammer, um, obviously, if you're a builder, it's a bit different. But if you're going out and you you're in a gang and you're caught with something like that, it's something they should be charged for it, in my opinion. I don't care what anyone says. Um, you've got that with the intention of using it. So, I mean, you're going out with intent. Should I mean, I think I don't know if it does hold a charge, but they don't. They just do someone for possession. But mm. it, it's it's a bit more than possession, isn't it? At the end of the day. So, well, yeah. I mean, because uh, nine times out of ten, if you're going to carry it. And you get put in that position, you're going to use it, you know. Yeah. Um, I've been on the end of weapons, you know. I've, I've been on the end of a, a, a machete, um, you know. I've, I've been stabbed six times. I've I've been slashed. I've been shot twice. I've been hit with everything that ends with the word bat, um, you know. And and these people don't think twice about bringing them out, and they certainly don't think twice about using them. You know, yeah. and, and putting a bat across your knees, and that is sort of that's the sort of person that that you have to look at. They need some serious um, education. Mm. Um, you know, I, I I know people that have um, been in and out of prison their whole lives um, that have never carried a weapon that have got on the wrong side of someone uh, and, and now they're no longer with us. Um, I know people that have carried weapons and they've changed their lives um, because, that you, you know, um, because of certain people around us. But at the end of the day, there are those that are unapologetic. There are those that carry a prison sentence as a badge of honour. Yeah. Um, and... While we have sort of lapsed laws on, you know, carrying and, and, and things like that, you know, I know IPP doesn't exi really exist anymore, even though there are over 3,000 
people still serving on, um, you know, public protection. Uh, but, um, you know, there's, there's no real deterrent. Um, you know, how do you educate people like that? That Because there's no real deterrent. Yeah, you stab someone, you get put put in jail. But then again, yeah, Tony said, look, um, maximum penalty for an adult carrying a knife is four years. An unlimited fine. So you get a prison sentence, but if you... You know, I mean, the, yeah, but, okay, the I, I understand that. that that that's the maximum sentence guided. That's a guideline. Bear in mind. But if I was to walk outside with a knife now, what's the chances of me actually getting four years? The chances are you're going to get a slap on the wrist and told not to do it again. You may get a little fine. Um, if I've done it again, maybe my fine will go up, and maybe end up doing a bit of community service. Um, but I mean, what's the chances of me actually going to prison? And maybe. For the third time, then you would end up getting a jail sentence. Yeah. But if I didn't... Hmm. sorry, mate, you're breaking up. Yes, something's going on, isn't it? Yeah, that's better. I've got you now. I just need to. I might. I just grab a charger for my for, for iPad, mate, because it's going to be yeah. quite good. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Hello. If anybody's got any questions, please feel free to put them down here. Um, I want to look at answering them. Um, welcome to the chat, uh, Tony um, and Kevin. Um, yeah, you are right, Kevin. Knife crime is a pandemic. Um, you know, like we said, there are people that go out there that are unapologetic about carrying, unapologetic about using. Uh, and they, you know, as we said, they they will carry a prison sentence like a badge, and then they'll come out. They'll get put straight into those circumstances again, and then they'll do it again, and they might get a bit longer. Um, and it, it's just, it's a no. vicious circle, you know. So, what are people's consensus about what we can do? How can we tackle knife crime? How can we tackle crimes with weapons? And how can we educate uh, the younger people? into the right thing. Yeah, that's right, Tony. There is no scare tactics. Um, you know, and it's only people like Ben um, and yourself uh, that are trying to sort of educate people. Um, but at the end of the day, you can try and scare somebody are they going to listen? Are people going to listen to scare tactics? Are people going to listen to cold hard facts? Or are they just going to brush it off and do what they want to do? You know, that's 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 the uh, quandary, that's the question. Um, you know, uh, Norwich, for instance, is, is quite high in knife crime and weapon crime. Not as high as London, but it's, it, you know, it's it's quite high in the crime, wherever there's high-rise flats and, you know, a high concentration of youth. Um, I'm having a right nightmare here, mate. <laughs> that's all right, mate. That's all right. Makes a change. It may not be me, to be honest. I've got one, man. <laughs> you can't get the fucking up. Sorry? Yeah, I think so, mate. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, what Tony what says, that there's a good chance of getting stopped. The, you know, stop and search is, you know, quite high at the minute. You know, especially in the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, you, you know, stop and search among the youth was high. Um, you know, it was disproportionately uh, black youth, e even in Norwich. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I, I think the most sense I heard was, um, what's his name, Big Nasty, um, when he was saying about... Um, 
you know, it's disproportionate. But if you see a white guy or a black guy on a summer's day walking through the street with a puffer jacket on, pull him. <laughs> you know, because they're going to be up to no good. But yeah, of course. You, you know, you can't tell intent. I, I've been pulled myself. You know, I'm, I was quite well known by the uh, local constabulary. Um, you know, I've never been one to carry anything but whatever I've scored. So, you know, I mean, people aren't scared of the police anymore. The kids certainly aren't. No, that's it. There's, there's, no, there's no fear, is there, about it's, it's the millennials they call them, don't they? They've grown up with, um, grown up with no respect, really. I mean, it's, I don't know. It's a tricky one. It's a tricky one to, uh, tricky one to to comment on, really, because I, my that's my opinion. I believe that kids have grown up with no respect. I believe that maybe we should bring back national service. I wouldn't have liked to have done it myself as a kid, but I think it's it's getting to the point where it's needed now, isn't it, sir? Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we need to be looking at sort of different ways because, you know, whatever is in place at the minute isn't working. It plainly isn't working. People aren't scared by the police. You've got these people that are jumping on YouTube and Facebook with the videos of them confront, confronting the police. Um, yeah. Quoting laws that, frankly, don't really exist. Um, but because think, of social media, it's a whole different bar game. I think a lot of it comes down to these, uh, I mean, I call them pen pushers, but these people that are making all these rules and regulations, you can't smack your kids nowadays. You used to be able to give your kid a good whack, and uh, nine times out of ten, that would be a bit of a deterrent for some things. I know I had a few slaps when I was younger. Shame. But nowadays, you, can, you can't do any of that. Same as with on the building sites, you end up with... Um, all this health and safety and red tape and all the and all these rules and regulations that prevent you from trying to do your own you do just what you're trying to do is your job. Um, but there's so many restrictions in place now. It's, even that's been made hard. So mm. yeah. So I mean, what's going forward? What are you hoping to do with Change Your Life, and how will you be? implementing that apart from the march and things like that what is in the sort of near future after lockdown if we do get out of lockdown but you know what what, what what's in your sights at the minute um well at the moment like i said we broke it broke the campaign down into three sections uh, prevent rehabilitate and educate so any way that we can sort of um, improve on these and, and implement any more uh any more um, programs to that, that will help us help us to deliver this basically. So at the moment, like I said, we're only four months into it. So things things are, um, I'm new to this. So and, um, it's, we, it's just wherever the path takes us, mate, really. That's, that's, that's where we're, um, we've got no real future plans other than the um, construction training center that we're all about opening up uh, and our educational programs. That's, that's, that's where we're at at the moment. So, Okay, brilliant. So what sort of people are you looking for to get involved? Well, something that we've been discussing, well, this I suppose this is progressing forward. Something we've just been discussing over the last couple of days is having um, ambassadors in local areas. So um, I've just been speaking to a guy today who is going to hopefully become the ambassador for his local area. Um, Discussed it. I've been speaking to a few of the people as well about becoming ambassadors for theirs. Um, it's just just to try and help localize the, the campaign and, and be able to focus more on these areas, having these ambassadors uh, representing us. So. Okay, so if somebody wants to become an ambassador, how do they go about that? Uh, send us an inbox message. If they send us an inbox message on the campaign group we'll be able to respond back to them from there. So it's on, on Facebook, be the best place to contact us on. Okay, brilliant. Um, I think that, I think we've probably pushed what we can do. Um, 
are there any questions that anybody wants to ask? I know there are a few people that have made a few comments, but um, now this this video will, will, will stay on Facebook. Um, we'll push it around some of the groups. We'll, um, we'll put it around some of the gangland groups and um, some of the writers groups and things like that. Um, and what I'll do is I'll link them to uh, Change Your Life. Yeah. Um, and we'll see if we can push some people your way. I heard people your way. <laughs> um, Appreciate I'm, it, mate. Thank you. I'm always happy to help. Um, we'll have a chat inbox and see what I can do from my end. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, we just keep in touch and um, we'll do another one of these, you know, a few months down the line and see where you're at then. Yeah, no, it'd be good to do another one after the end of lockdown or a couple of months after lockdown to see uh, where, where we, what direction it's taking us in, basically. So, Brilliant. I keep, I keep hearing an echo on the... Can you hear the echo on the... I can slightly. Yeah, it's like repeating what we're saying. Yeah, it's, 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 it's been really bad on some of my other videos, um, which is why I, I tend to use earphones if I can, or I advise other people to use earphones. But it's quite gentle, so it's it's not really um, it's not really bothering me to be honest. No, it happened. It's happened. It seemed to happen as soon as my um, iPad was losing charge. So I think it might be. I think I may have messed it up somehow or another. So <laughs> that's all right, mate. All right, no. well, thanks for coming on. No, thanks for having me thanks on. Thanks for mate. sharing your story. Um, I'll link everybody down there, uh, and I'll see you soon. All right, mate. Cheers, Jack. Thank you, buddy. Cheers, mate. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Hiya. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, thank everybody for, um, you know, commenting and stuff. Uh, we'll go through some of the comments and see about um, answering them. Um, I want to take a, a second to thank Ben um, for coming on um, and, and, and sharing about what he's doing and the brilliant work. I've um, got lots of respect for that. Um, thanks for your input, Tony. Um, always a pleasure, mate. Um, and yeah, so um, we're looking at episode four that's coming up uh, soon. Um, that's most likely going to be Paul Bogey, uh, Heroin to Hero. Um, there's been some problems in arranging dates with people and things like that. We've also got um, the legend that is. Um, Peter Blexley coming on um, next week um, to talk about his life as an undercover policeman uh, and his um, uh, his book and hunt for um, gangland uh, figure Kevin Parl. Um, so that should be really interesting. Um, I should say that um, I've got a couple of books out, but this is this was my first book, Personal Apocalypse. Um, this is available from Warcry Press on Amazon um, and it's my um, poetic memoirs of um, when I was growing up uh, and involved in uh, the criminal fraternity and my mental health and getting out of that uh, up, up till uh, about six, seven years ago. Um, so yeah, um, both my books, um, this and um, Between the Streetlights and Red Lights, um, is are available from Amazon and also Warcry Press. Um, so, yeah, cheers everybody for um, getting involved. Um, we'll push this out to some of the groups. Let's see if we can get some of the um, decent figures on this, like, like we did with the Nagus one. Um, and I'll see you again for part four. Cheers, guys.